The Bob Murphy Show, episode 326. There's a tidal wave coming. What you gonna do? Get ready for another episode of The Bob Murphy Show. The podcast promoting free markets, free minds, and grateful souls. It's your source for commentary and interviews, conducted by a Christian and economist. Now here is your host, Bob Murphy. Hey everybody, welcome back to The Bob Murphy Show. Today we're going to do a double dip. I'm rebroadcasting an interview I did with somebody else, but this one's really cool. And... I would also encourage you to go check out the YouTube version of this if you're currently listening just to the audio version, because what it is, it's it's the gauntlet. So Luke Avery, I was on his podcast, I don't know, like a year ago, something like that, and he had me back, and he has this clever new system where it's kind of like a choose-your-own-adventure, where the people go through the gauntlet, and then there's categories, and then you get to basically choose the specific question that you want to answer, and then he scores you. And that's how it works. So it's it was much more enjoyable and entertaining than a standard interview. So I thought you'd like it. And we cover a whole host of topics ranging from universal basic income through metaphysics and artificial intelligence, all kinds of cool stuff. So here is my run through the gauntlet. Hope you like it. Bob Murphy, welcome to The Gauntlet. I am excited and intimidated at the same time. Thank you. That is the correct reaction to the gauntlet. <laughs> Round one. Do you want to talk about music, economics, or cosmology? Let's start with economics. Are you on kind of home territory here? And you don't, you've got no idea what the topics are for the rest of this. So <laughs> right, right. Make, make the most of the, the friendly ground. Um, UBI is necessary. The privatization of healthcare leads to inefficiencies or progressive taxation reduces inequality. Why don't we go with the UBI one? And are you arguing for or against UBI? I'm going to argue against it. All right, let's hear it. Okay, so I am stipulating for the purposes of this argument that UBI means guaranteed by the state. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I will say it's certainly not necessary. In fact, I'll even argue a stronger case that it, I think it's undesirable. Um, so for, for one thing is make it real simple. It's, it's unnecessary because anything the government is going to be giving you would be coming via the private sector. And I'll get, you know, if you want to push back on that, I can explain why I know MMT people would push back. Um, and, but beyond that, and so because of that, I would say, therefore, um, that it's best left to individuals to decide how they want to, if they want to engage in charitable contributions or not. It, Would the MNT people say you you can just print money and, and that comes from like the universe? Right. So if we want to, um, yes, to go down that path. So it's, in the MNT framework, right, they would say, what are you talking about? Like they reject the whole idea of, the government needs to tax in order to be able to fund government spending because their point is, no, with fiat money and a monetary sovereign, the money's all coming from the government in the first place. So even with, within that framework, though, I mean, ultimately, if you know, you're going to get your basic UBI check every month from the government so that you can go and buy the necessities of life, ultimately, it's not receiving a certain amount of dollars or pounds even electronically deposit in your bank account that allows you to live and to have a shelter. It, you know, there must physically be food that was grown on a farm somewhere and delivered to the grocery store. And, you know, there must have someone must have built the apartment or the house that you're living in. And that's ultimately, you know, so it's real resources that are ultimately supplying the things that the money is just the, the vehicle or the tool with which you buy it or acquire it. And so in that sense, I'm saying even in an MMT framework, Ultimately, if there's a UBI program set up, it's still that's just influencing the distribution and the use of society's real resources. And mm -hmm. so I'm saying there's no uh, that my argument is that 
the ultimate way that social preferences, if you will, somehow interact with each other in order to steer how society's resources are distributed. I am saying I think both theory and history show that leaving that to the private voluntary sector is far more humane and also efficient than having the political process hijack that. UBI would have the curious effect that the Cantillon effect of the, the first person who gets the money gets the most value out of it. Because prior to inflation, you know, they get to spend they get to spend the money before the inflation happens, as it were, would would be members of the general public rather than I feel like normally it's behind closed doors, it's big institutions. Do you, do you think there's any do, do you have any feeling that um big corporations like you, you you're talking about private institutions but but once you get to a certain scale and you're able to lobby and you almost become a part of the state are, the, are these groups that we would actually want to um, deprive of some of these advantages well what are the advantages can you just elaborate on well that? i'm just not sure what you're arguing so let's suppose the money is either going to be given so this the state I, I think it's fair to say both of us usually see state action as as negative in especially mm. economic terms. Mm -hmm. um, but of the things that the state does, I'd argue it's even more pernicious when they're lending favors to um, corporations, even if they're sort of nominally private. If they're big enough, then they almost... They, so the advantage here would be okay, money is going to flow out of state coffers into the economy. The first person who gets access to it has the advantage of spending it prior to its inflationary effect. So UBI at least has the advantage that the people who get it first it okay. are actual people. Yeah. So, yeah, if you depending on how you framed it, if it were, if I think what I'm, I'm understanding is you're saying something along the lines of, hey, given that the government, the, let's take the US government, is going to spend five trillion dollars wouldn't it be better rather than it doing it right now and giving a little bit sprinkling here and there of social support programs but then huge military contracts and right. all kinds of income flowing to i guess treasury holders and this and you know and other banks and whatnot you know it's very mysterious and behind closed door wouldn't it be easier yeah. or wouldn't it be more straightforward and fair if everybody just got a lump sum check and then, yes, there would still be inflation, but like you're saying, it, w it would be almost like be a one fell swoop. It wouldn't be the sequential process where, depending on what we you know, if you're third or fourth in line, like everyone's kind of getting the money. Yeah. The, the, the hairdresser only gets the government money yeah. through the paycheck of the Raytheon employee at the moment. Right, right. right. So, yes, and that's actually so. So, yeah, insofar as it goes, pro probably you know, depending it would depend on the specifics. But yeah, I'm sure you could construct a scenario where I'd rather everyone just gets a lump sum of the of the amount. Um, and th there's also, so there are some free market economists who are, who are in favor of UBI, not so much for the reasons you're talking about, but more that like, Hey, if we got rid of all the current welfare programs that are means tested, because that discourages work effort. And so the mm, idea is that if yeah. everyone just gets a flat check and go earn as much as you want or as little as you want, well then at least on the margin, there's not some people because there's people for whom, like if they go earn more money and then that means their food stamps get scaled back or maybe they're living in rent uh, controlled apartments that are tied to their income thing. And, and um, health insurance, you know, under the Affordable Care Act, also known as the Obamacare, some of that stuff is means tested. And so, yeah, there's this guy, Casey Mulligan, this University of Chicago professor did a thing, I don't know, a few years ago where he was assessing the marginal, the implicit marginal tax rates. So like you could get caught in these traps where if you're low income, it's like if you earned another ten thousand dollars, the government would keep nine thousand of it, in a, in a sense, because by scaling back your other your support. So, the idea is being if you're stuck there, it's not really worth it to you to go earn, you know, to to go to school or to do something else, work a second job to boost your income by ten thousand. If when when the dust settles, you only get a little bit more that you keep in terms of take home pay. So. Yeah, I, I can still be all of that, but by the by the same token, I'm going to still if you say so in the real world is UBI necessary or would I even support it? I would still say no, because 
you're not going to keep all those other things separate. You know what I mean? This is, I think, even if they did get rid of some of that stuff and then put in UBI, that other stuff would just creep back in. And so I think you'd have the worst of both worlds. Can I ask you about the hot button issue that I think is relevant to this question of AI? Sure. Um, are you worried about the economic impacts of artificial intelligent technologies? No. Um, and and so with this stuff too, it's, it is possible that we could end up in a, in like a, a Jetsons world, right? If you remember the, the cartoon, the <laughs> Jetsons. Scarcity. Yeah. So, you know, it, it, there, like, again, it's, it would be a good thing in a sense if the problem was, oh man, everybody can ling- will live like kings and, you know, the, it's, the machines are doing all the work for us and you have this huge standard, high standard of living. Um, so I, and no, I, I, I'm not worried about that. Like, oh geez, is, is it, you know, all, all the machines might be able to grow too much food and they might cure cancer and everything. And, you know, all the doctors, <laughs> all the cancer doctors, they went to school for nothing. And, oh gee, man, what are we going to do? So, you know, and that, so that's one application of it. So, in general, no, I'm not worried about that. And also, again, to, like I say, it's um, if people are worried about that. So let me put it to you this way. I have mm-hmm. seen a lot of billionaires coming out in favor of UBI precisely for what you're saying. And like they're saying, oh, yeah, we're, we're trying to get ahead and get this world. But to me, what's very dystopian is the idea that 90% of the population just lives on government support and they live in little, you know, eight by eight cubicles where they put on their mm. VR headsets and they just live in the metaverse all day. And, you know, the, the robots grow all the food and make all the stuff in the factories and everything. And then there's a few billionaires who kind of own planet Earth. So mm. that might sound funny for me as like a libertarian guy saying that. But but to me, that that wouldn't be a free market outcome. That would be like a yeah. state multinational, you know, multi-trillionaire you know, at that point, Nexus. Uh, and so that would be the way they would take over humanity is, is through that route. So that... No, I I don't think that's a virtue. Like, oh, at least then everybody would be dependent on the state for their ba- sustenance. Like, everybody in the Soviet Union was dependent on the state for their bare sustenance. No, that's not a, that's not at the mark of a humane society. That's a <laughs> you know a totalitarian one. It feels like the socialists view that the world is largely free market and and observe a bunch of problems and and therefore say, oh, this this is the free market world and look at the problems and. Um, on the libertarian side, I th- which I would largely still count myself on, on that side, um, it seems like the world is f- very much not free market and, and we observe problems. And mm-hmm. to a large degree, we say, well, the, these problems are caused by the lack of free market. It's, it's funny, the, um, the observed problems are so in your face it's it's like both right. extremes are pointing to the same issues but drawing totally different conclusions about the causes well yeah i mean one manifestation of what you're talking about is when it comes to us politics at least most of the time people will mock libertarian types and say no one listens to you oh you austrian school economists like you're dinosaurs nobody cares about you da 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 but then occasionally someone will come out and complain that, oh, the reason we don't have prosperity is because the Fed <laughs> is afraid of Ron Paul. Right. You know, and, and like, are all these budget hawks in Congress are afraid of the libertarian wing? Or so, you know what I mean? Like it's, yeah. or we had this wave of deregulation spawned by the libertarian right winger nut jobs. And so it's on the one hand, like we have no power and we're the laughing stock of everyone. On the other hand, we run the world. So... Well, uh, uh, yes, I'm much more in the. If, if I was criticizing the libertarians, I'd definitely take the former tack that, that they have far yeah. too little power, and if if they if they could get more power, the world would would be a better place. I, I just having said that, let me just mention though, because it, it is an interesting point. I thought about this too that I have noticed sometimes I'm concerned that quote like my team or my side is committing the same mistake. So I'm sure you've seen this, Luke, where. If, mm. if you're talking to an actual communist that and you bring up you know the track record, they will just say, well, that wasn't real communism. Or yeah, yeah, Stalin was a bad guy. I don't, but I'm not yeah. a Stalinist. I'm not saying go kill everybody, you know, that kind of stuff. And so, and by the same token, though, I have seen like if someone talks about um 
like, I don't know if this is on your radar, but like Enron was an energy company and they were, had a big talk about deregulation and they came and it was a disaster. What happened in California when they quote deregulated electricity. And Mm. then a lot of libertarian free market types would say, well, that's not true deregulation because they only deregulated the wholesale market, but not the retail. And Mm -hmm. so whenever something doesn't work out, yeah, we often would say that's not real libertarianism because of da 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 and we can give all the reasons why, you know, very rarely does someone say, you're right, my ideology is wrong. That that usually mm-hmm. – but having said that, you know, in an attempt for me to kind of be fair, still I can say, you know, there's very clear-cut tests, East and West Germany, North and South Korea, you know, similar areas where there was a huge divide largely just along, you know, po- policy lines, not because the population was different or the culture or whatnot. And it's pretty clear the difference in prosperity between East and West Germany and certainly North and South Korea and, you know, examples like that I could give. Um, And also it's places like there's objective assessments of of an economic freedom index put out by places like the Fraser Institute. And there Mm. I've, you know, I've done meta reviews of the literature, reviews of the literature, um, you know, going through that stuff, just showing there's lots of quantitative assessments of rating like places. Singapore might be an interesting example. Exactly, yeah. So, but, you know, any one example, you can come up, every partisan can come up with the particulars. But when you start yeah. doing regression analysis and like looking the at- The other side would say Somalia. Yeah, look, looking at, you know, 50 countries over a 50-year period and blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, there's a very sig- statistically significant uh, result in terms of infant mortality being much lower to the higher the economic freedom index is stuff like that and you know gdp growth and unemployment rates blah 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 so i'm just saying it's it's not an all or nothing thing where oh yes if you're a communist you kind of have to say we need absolute total f- communism just done right or else yeah maybe it leads to mass murder whereas i'm saying no i i don't need complete liberalization of markets or else it leads to mass starvation it's like no a country that's pretty free economically is going to be a lot better than a country that's pretty not free. It's not that mm-hmm. I need it to be a knife edge case and they do it just the way I recommend or else it doesn't count. Well, what do you think of the Old Testament laws? Like, wasn't there something every seven years property would sort of reset in some sense? Yeah, yeah, Jubilee. Year of Jubilee, right? Yep. It, is that something we should learn lessons from that that in a way, uh, God was saying to the the nation of Israel, you, you you will you will you know there's dangers in completely free markets, and that mm-hmm. there are some anti free market measures that will improve your um, you know improve the way you live as a nation. So what's fascinating about this, so for for the listeners who are maybe not familiar, yeah, in the Old mm-hmm. Testament there were provisions that. Um, how did it was it like every 49 years there was some real big daddy one was it yeah like a, like a seven of seven seven, kind seven of times deal? seven yeah i'll look up the exact details okay. while you're talking. but but yeah so the, <laughs> what was interesting so, so the idea folks is that that yes like you you couldn't permanently sell your birthright in other words like yeah you could have liens against it and borrow against it and so forth but ultimately no matter how deep a hole you dug yourself into financially it would reset and i think there was a deal like every seven years one thing would happen and then i believe it was a, like the seven of the seven, so every 49 years, mm. was this grand reset where everything reverted to the original, like the slates were wiped clean. But what's interesting, Luke, is even within that framework, it showed, I don't remember the exact passages and where it was, but like if you were selling property to somebody, like it would take into account the fact that, oh, wait a minute, this guy's only going to get to hang on to it for three years and then it's going to revert. So the amount mm-hmm. you can sell it for is only you know three years worth of production or something you know, which would different. happen naturally i'm sure yeah yeah but anyway i'm just saying it was it was showing the explicit accounting of it so where i'm going with this is to say yeah i it's an intriguing concept to agree with you and it did seem like they were building in some paternalism and saying no mm-hmm. we are not going to let humans with their short-sightedness completely dig themselves into a hole like there's safeguards in place but on the other hand, it was like everybody knew that in terms of the contract. So it wasn't just they would come in afterward and right. you know, some guy bought yes. my house and he thought it was his house and he paid me up front thinking it's going to be his house now. And then a bit later, the priests come along and say, no, no, you can't do that. That's not fair. And, he, and the guy just takes your ho- the house back and says it's his. That wouldn't happen that everybody would kind of know ahead of time. So it'd be sort of like, um, you know, if we just say as a society, you're not allowed to sell yourself into slavery. 
right? So like this is one of the issues that libertarian theorists debate about. You know, I have these mm-hmm. these intricate. You know, could you? In the, and some say yes, and some say no. And you know, meaning like what is that? Like ultimately, yeah, I'm selling you the future, my future labor services forever, and so that you mm-hmm. own you know the output of my body kind of deal. And you could even mm-hmm. put in provisions, and you're allowed to whip me. You know, you could get all kinds of crazy stuff. And other people, <laughs> you know, hard blooded libertarians who who are very committed to property rights, like no, in principle, you can't do that. You do not have the right to sell yourself into slavery, kind of deal. Like you just so mm. with a thing like that. So the point is, the legal code could go one way or the other, and the idea is just given it is what it is. Fine. So like, if it's not a legally enforceable contract, yeah. then. You know, it's just nobody would ever pay you thinking they were getting it, or they if they were they did, they'd be stupid. Just like if they tried to buy a square circle from you, you know, <laughs> you could say that's that's not an enforceable. What does that mean? So, mm-hmm. I, it, like, like, likewise with with that, um, I think C.S. Lewis has an interesting. I'm going to botch it, but he has something to say along the lines of it's interesting that not just the Judeo Christian tradition, but many other you know religious traditions throughout history have all had either warnings against regulations on or outright prohibitions of what they call usury, and yet our mm. modern financial system is based on it. He had a quote mm. something, and he just said something like, so that's something for us to ponder. And so, yes, to answer your original question, Luke, I, I have wondered that a lot, and certainly I, when I've had uh, encounters with credit card companies, <laughs> when mm-hmm. I haven't been mm-hmm. a wise steward of my resources, <laughs> and I said, what? You know, and presumably, I signed some contract when I first got the card that said, in this scenario, the APR can jump to 33%. And I'm like, are you kidding me? What? So uh, um, I, I do imagine that, yes, even in a free society, there could be provisions in there about like unconscionable, con- like you can't get yourself into a really ludicrous situation. The courts would just say that, no, even if you signed a piece of it. Last thing I'll say mm-hmm. on this, I know mm-hmm. we're get, I'm getting bogged down, but like sure. when I was in high school, my friends would come over and we would gamble. And, and I had this one board. I came up with, we were trying to like simulate like other house games besides card games for the casino might have. And I had this uh-huh. board game like with different payouts and, and you could you just throw the dice and just depending on what happened. And this one time, my friend was just like in a rut mentally and he kept putting the chips on something. He just kept rolling the dice. And I'm, I had a piece of paper and I was keeping track of how much he owed me. Like I was being the uh-huh. house. And I would uh, keep stopping him and hold his hand and look him in the uh, eye and say, right now, you owe me, you know, we were kids in high school, but it was like $200. Are you sure uh-huh. you want to keep it? He goes, yes, yes, yes. And by uh, the end of it, he owed me some ludicrous, and we just, we didn't think that was real. You know what I mean? Like, I was like, okay, right. yeah, right. technically you owe me $800 right now, but we know that's not real and we kind of just forgot about uh, it. Or maybe he gave me 50 bucks or something when next time he got paid. But I'm just saying, so yes, to answer your question, I do think despite, you know, one's commitment to the sanctity of contracts and all this stuff, that there could be a role for uh, you get into a crazy position and I guess declaring bankruptcy and just getting to start over. And it doesn't mean, you know, certainly you don't go to prison for debtor's prison. I was listening to something earlier today about um, the the Bearings Bank incident. And uh, that reminds me a lot of what your friend was getting into there, yeah. I think. <laughs> just to clarify, so every seven years was a sabbatical year which had you had to rest your land debts that were owed by fellow israelites would be forgiven and hebrew slaves would be set free and then i think this is quite neat so seven times seven 49 and then an extra year making it 50 so tidy Mm -hmm. units of 50 um, was the year of jubilee and land that had been sold was returned to the original family or tribal owners and again, Hebrew slaves set free and various other resets of economic conditions. Um, I, there's this uh, thing economists talk about as the the Matthew principle, right? That um, to him who has more will you know, mm-hmm. be given mm-hmm. and to him who has not, even what he does have will be taken away. It, it does feel like there's that natural inclination that uh, at some point there's a, there's a runaway factor in economics where no longer are you being rewarded for hard work but you're now being rewarded for um being so far ahead like in poker it's a a certain point if you if you're far enough ahead it's fairly easy to crush somebody else Mm -hmm. just from your sheer position 
rather than your skill. And, so, and maybe to tie this back to the UBI stuff, because with what you're just yeah, saying, right. so I think part of the principle there was, you know, the lands were distributed to the tribes of Israel in a certain way, and it was like it was that that land was always going to remain in that tribe, no matter what they did, their descendants, their children, children's children, and so on. Like, no, it's going to mm. revert to make sure that the tribes each have what they were given. And so likewise, to tie this to UBI, like I'm going to have a policy. I don't have grandkids yet, but assuming I end up having them where, yeah, if they ever want to come and stay at my house, they're allowed to do that. And I don't care mm -hmm. what trouble they get into or whatever, they can go. But I'm mm -hmm. not going to let my grandkids sell that right to somebody else. You know what right. I mean? Like if some guy yeah. shows up in my house and says, yeah, your grandkid was really, you know, he owed me a bunch of money. And so he said that I can now come <laughs> stay here for the summer. I'm just wow, going to say, no, yeah. I'm, I'm not giving him the authority to sell that. Like it's it's his, yes. he's a quote entitled to it because of his yeah. heritage. But no, I'm not letting him alienate that from himself. Mm. Yes, yes. Well, right. Well, we, we must bring this round to, to an end. As, as much as I'd love to keep talking about economics here, I'm going to give you a score of 17. Okay. Um, and you've got no context for... I know. I don't means. know. Is that out of 20 or out of 100? Who knows? It's not, it's not out of anything. <laughs> it's a completely free-floating index. Okay. <laughs> um, ethics, history, or metaphysics? Let's try metaphysics. Ooh. Time is illusory. Our experience of consciousness disproves materialism, or everything is meaningless. Whew. Okay. Uh, <laughs> let's do the middle one, because I think that's going to be the most interesting. Uh -huh. Okay, experience of and I will argue in the affirmative for that. All right, great. Okay, so I think there's a pretty straightforward, I don't know if this is a proof necessarily, but it's close to, I think, argument that um, if you believed in a material, a purely materialist conception of the world, and that ultimately you were trying to explain everything just in terms of, you know, the atoms bouncing around and, okay, at first there was you know, just gases and whatnot. There's the Big Bang. We don't know why, but there, maybe there's a multiverse and this happens to be a universe where the fine-tuning dials were such that life could emerge. It's this, you know, blind mutation and natural selection acting upon the random mutations and so forth. And then it, in that framework, um, everything would have to follow from the laws of physics in the materialist conception, like to give rise to organisms that we see now walking, you know, we're all just cells and, you know, obeying the laws of physics. So all that would would have to be true. It would have to follow on merely physical principles, right? From the big bang up into the present. Like there's no, there's no point at which the intervention of some external disembodied will influence the course of the matter of, you mm -hmm. know, like meaning the physical matter, you know? And so therefore, you would be able to tell the entire story, the whole history of the universe without reference to consciousness at all. Mm -hmm. And so then why would, so if you wanted to then invoke it, you could, but all you would be saying is, and then there's this thing piggybacking on that, that serves no function whatsoever. That does mm -hmm. not at all, you know, enhance the um, reproductive fitness of these organisms because again, you know, you're not going to, once you got down to the cellular or atomic level, it's not that, oh, and here's where the consciousness made the hydrogen atom do this instead of this. Yeah, right. That, that's yeah. clearly not going to be the case. And so <laughs> if you can tell the whole story without consciousness, mm -hmm. at best, you, you know, you would conclude consciousness must be some kind of illusion. And so, so what function, how does it help? So I yeah. think doing that is more of a proof by contradiction to say that can't be right. If consciousness exists and we think it does, it must be doing something. And then, you know, to me, it's so that that's kind of the way I would I would narrowly try to disprove the the proposition. To to me, this assertion is extremely strong, but fairly obvious, and mm -hmm. and completely missed by atheists to the point where when I try to discuss this with people who disagree with me, I I feel like. Perhaps they just don't have consciousness. Maybe they just don't have <laughs> any any first person experience of uh -huh. life at all. Because it seems so straight, so patently clear to me that the things that I am experiencing 
have a quality that is beyond what can be explained by atoms bouncing around. I, I wonder whether people get confused by the idea of emergence. You know that, mm -hmm. say, like, ants follow simple rules. In fact, isn't it even mentioned in Ecclesiastes, right? They, they have no... Um, they have no leaders. They don't worry about planning, and yet they they manage to do these incredible things. Um, that you know they store for the winter time, and they they the things they build have these incredible emergent qualities. And I think people therefore kind of believe that anything can be produced by emergence. That there there is no connection between <clears throat> the the zoomed in micro perspective and then the, the macro properties of the system. Um, but I, I would say that's a misunderstanding because the things that the ants are doing do total the macro result. And, you know, if, if the things the ants are doing is moving, it's still a physical property that they create. Do you know what I mean? I know what you mean. Um, I would, so let me, first of all, say, yes, like what you're, you're getting at the distinction and the, you know, the quality, I guess that's the way some philosophers would talk about it. Mm. I do think that's a powerful argument, but like I said, with the thing I went through, I just recently encountered that. I was listening to some podcast and some guy went through, you know, the argument I just recapitulated to you and I had yeah. never thought of it like that. And I was like, whoa, that seems like a pretty neat little proof. Yeah. Um, so I agree with the way you put it lately here on the the whole emergent phenomena stuff. I understand the claim, but I, it's so the way I encounter it is a lot of atheist um, free market economist types or libertarians will get frustrated with me because I I've done a lot in the in intelligent design field in mm -hmm. terms of like immersing myself in there and then trying to popularize what I think are some of the best arguments and that and examples. And so mm -hmm. I've gotten pushback from people saying, what are you talking about? Bob doesn't, you know, your, your home court territory of economics, there's all kinds of, we call it spontaneous order, things that are the result of human action, but not of human design. But what's uh -huh. interesting is in there, and this is something that I didn't realize until recently, there's a, a uh, Adam Smith is constantly misquoted, his famous right. invisible hand. Yeah. The way people normally, I've heard them say, and I've even gone and like documented that I wasn't just inventing this, that economists will say, oh, and as Smith said, things are led or people, you know, in the market are led as if by an invisible hand. He didn't say as if Smith himself said are led by an invisible hand. Huh. You see what I mean? And, and he was very religious. His earlier work was the theory of moral sentiments. And so, you know, so he was kind of like a wow. Scottish moralist. So huh. I think Smith himself, when he saw the invisible that, hand was God, was God. Yeah. Like, so, I mean, you just think how huh. gorgeous that is, right? It's consistent with scripture, right? Like Joseph saying to his brothers, what you intended for evil, God used for good. So that's kind of yes. like, yeah, Smith's whole deal. Like, yeah, everyone's just narrowly seeking profit, and yet they are led to promote the welfare of everybody. And so for him to say there's but, an invisible but, hand and to mean, they, yeah, that's that's God designing the world such that it takes our base selfish desires and flips it so we turn into service to humanity, that's exactly the kind of thing the Christian God would do. And so what I'm getting at with all this is – Yes, the principle of emergent uh, phenomena and things not being planned, and yet the result is gorgeous. To me, I'm, I said, given that I believe in God, I think that's just his signature on everything. And that far mm. from us saying, well, we know from nature that all kinds of amazing things can happen that certainly look like they were designed, but we know they weren't. And actually, I, I said, no, I think for other reasons that they were designed. And so I'm just seeing this all over the place that mm -hmm. <laughs> crazy, incredible things that don't look, you know, that you wouldn't think would be the result of blind processes. And ultimately given my metaphysics, I would say are not the result of blind processes. Mm. Just to dive into intelligent design for a second, because I, mm -hmm. I can't resist. <laughs> um, I, I think my position that I've ended up coming to here is that um, I don't think that the Bible is entirely easy to understand and interpret at the beginning of Genesis, but I also couldn't trust the scientific consensus as far as I could throw it. Um, mm -hmm. and, I, and I think I've just ended up in a position of complete uh, ambiguity. Like I, I, 
I genuinely am open to either option in a way. And probably if I if I got in a time machine and went back and and was just to put a bet on pure mm. instinct of what I was going to see, um, that it would probably be closer to the <laughs> the old seven day creationist account with mm-hmm. maybe some caveats than the perspective that modern science paints. Um, but what, like how how strongly do you hold your convictions about the way you see? Um, the kind of the the mechanics of the creation of the world. Okay, sure, great, great question. But let me clarify because I think maybe you might misunderstand what some of these people are saying. So huh. the 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 leaders in the intelligent design movement, people like um, Michael Behe, for example. So he's a biochemist. He was the one who um, his catchphrase is uh, irreducible complexity. So he's saying hmm. in in biology we see all kinds of structures that it's like 19 different moving parts all have to come together for this thing to work. Like his famous mm. one is the, ba- the bacterial flagellum. And the, you know, mm. it's like, he says, it's like an outboard motor and you can go and they see that his discovery institute makes nice little videos showing this thing. And yeah, if you didn't know anything otherwise, and someone showed you that you would think this was like a little nanobot that the Chinese developed or something. It looks right. like a little submersible, you know, like a, like a submarine that is built on yeah. you know, at, a, at a tiny scale. You wouldn't think it was everything organic. on the inside of the cell is like that. It's yeah, like exactly much yeah, so more complicated than any right. factory that we've ever built. Yeah. Right. So anyway, so I'm saying that guy. So he's you know a huge big gun in the ID movement. My mm-hmm. understanding is he believes in the theory of common descent and that the, mm-hmm. the you know he thinks the Earth is billions of years old. So he doesn't believe in the special creation account in Genesis. He he's a, mm-hmm. a Christian. So when he's mm-hmm. talking about intelligence, his point is he you know he doesn't have a problem with the claim that all current life forms share a common cell billions of years ago where all life came from. His point is though, the story of how did that first cell then turn into and spawn all of these different life forms we see today, it could not possibly just be random mutation acted upon by natural selection that there's, he thinks there there would have to have been an incredible amount of information embedded either so in that cell or in the environment in ways that no. defy probability that, that no he's with no darwin way. on the origin of species but he doesn't mm-hmm. believe in abiogenesis apart from a divine intervention i, I mean th- so th- that's one way of, of saying it but even there it's more i think he'd be okay if there was a pond and a lightning bolt hit it and then you know amino acids came together and blah 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 but his point would be to say if you just did the probability of that happening be just because it would have still been one in 60 quadrillion mm-hmm. and so it would have mm-hmm. been a miracle for okay. everything to come together just right in order for that to happen. And so um, his point is, if you really understood the probabilities of what was involved, you would say that was just a miracle that happened. How did that happen? Mm. Whereas he thinks the modern, you know, the standard Darwinian biologist thinks that, oh, it yeah. seems miraculous, but no, because if given enough time. So another way of putting it is to say, as some of these guys have tried to quantify it, that no, the universe would have to be, trillions of years old in order for the Darwinian mechanism to lead to what we see right now. And it's just, there's not enough time yeah. for that to have occurred. So, Whereas, so I was creating, yeah. uh, so it sounds like I was creating a bit of a false dichotomy between ID and the uh, Yeah, yeah. So that, that was one, just a clarification. So now sure. if you're asking me who's, yeah. I, I mean, I've dabbled in, so I'll put it this way, my personal faith does not rest on mm. you know, and then on the third day God created this and then especially to say they're 24 hour days. Because for one thing, like, how did we get that account? <laughs> um, you know, God must have inspired, you know, somebody. Yeah, uh, I've heard people say, actually, nobody knew about um, the contents of Genesis until Moses. Like, Adam and Eve had no, no right, idea. Right, yeah, I, I haven't studied enough Bible history and whatnot to know, is that really what Bible scholars say? Particularly, you know, I, I would trust ones that believe like I do. <laughs> but, yes. Um, but yes, so, you know, whether it was Adam and then he told Methuselah and he told, you know, Noah and da-da-da, or whether it was Moses was the first one to see this vision and then wrote it down. Either way, mm-hmm. even Adam was not there on, on day one, right? Mm-hmm. So I'm saying all of this stuff necessarily must have been somebody saw a vision, you know, Holy Spirit showed him or whatever, and so I could imagine, like, let's say it did take billions of years. Like there was a big bang and then the galaxies formed and da, 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 da. 
Well, it's not like the vision's going to last 6 billion years, right? Like it would have to be condensed. So maybe I- I'm open to the idea that the person who wrote the first few chapters of Genesis could have seen like a video in his head of what happened mm-hmm. and not understood the time mm-hmm. scale and, and mm-hmm. might have said stuff that he was using the best words he could to describe what that, you know, he wasn't a trained physicist, so he's not going to. Mm. And then the gases coalesced and, you know, the hydrogen began fusing and turning into, you know, that's not going to happen. <laughs> he's not going to use that language. So Yeah. yeah. All right. It sounds like we're in fairly s- similar positions <laughs> with regards to that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so just, what I am confident, though, is just to not try to ride the fence yeah. is the standard Darwinian mechanism. I think there's all kinds of stuff piling up showing like there's just to give your audience an idea, like there's people now coming in from like computer science. And so there's certain results in information theory saying like, if you're looking at a system and it has a certain amount of information embedded into it, and then later it has more information that, you know, that must have come from somewhere. It's not that the system on its own gains more information, mm-hmm. you know, kind of deal. So, so if, if that's the framework you're using, then, you know, given that the world looked a certain way, like, like where, how did, you know, they call it the genetic code, mm-hmm. right? And so there is a sense in which even a- a- atheist biologists view the DNA almost like as a computer program. And so the idea yeah, I, is that I, you could have a system that then could program itself with something more sophisticated than it started out with. And you say, oh, well, it came from the environment. And the, but again, that just pushed the problem back. Okay, how come all that information was embedded in the environment in order to create these amazing creatures we see? Like a mountain's not mm-hmm. very complicated, how did a mountain in the streams and the air turn, you know, spawn these amazing organisms? Like it just doesn't fit. I, yeah, I, I, I'm um, I'm a programmer by day, as it were, mm-hmm. and um, I actually I was working on a project at work through part of last year that was to do with microbiology. So we had some um, some education on how the cell works. And I was struck over and over again by how similar a lot of the stuff that's going on at that genetic level is to programming concepts, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. including like, you know, um, CRISPR, the thing that they use for cutting up genes. Um, the, the reason we have that technology is because um, there's sort of warfare that happens between bacteria <laughs> where they will kind of send a little device well, it's actually a little ring of DNA into the cell that then causes all kinds of mayhem. So to defend against that, there is a, there's an antivirus <laughs> where it will look at incoming pieces of... Because uh, sharing genes between bacteria happens all the time. You want that mechanism to happen, but you don't want this malicious code, which is essentially the same thing as a computer virus. Mm-hmm. So when it comes in, you line it up and check it off against your pattern and if it matches the pattern you chop it and the reason the reason you chop it is just to destroy it it's like cut it mm-hmm. into pieces and that's it's that mechanism of lining it up with our pattern and then chopping that we use for gene splicing um and i was like wow this is you know antivirus software that we think we're so clever because mm-hmm. we came up with it but i'm like no god made that you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah, many, many, many years ago, we're, we're just coming to the party quite late with a lot of this computer stuff. Yeah, so like along those lines, right? So I mean, ultimately, if you believe in God, then there's a sense in which no matter what happened, He designed all the life forms. And then the question's just, did He first just see it in His mind, and then physically, as it evolved on Earth in the physical world, you know, did it look like it quote happened naturally, or you know, all of a sudden, boom, and then He made zebras. And then he made humans and that, you know, that kind of thing. And I, Mm. my inclination right now is to say it would be more impressive, more elegant if he just, you know, allowed it to quote naturally unfold into all these different varied organisms that he of course must have a priori invented intellectually, Mm. you know, in his mind before he instantiated them. But of course, you know, he's got to do whatever he wants, but. I I, I think my slight hesitation with that is Mm -hmm. that, there seems from the New Testament to be very clearly, you know, one Adam, as 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 in Adam all sin, so in Jesus mm-hmm. all are raised to life. There's kind of a singular Adam. And if if you're gonna have the 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 emergence of humans 
through an evolutionary pathway and yet pick out a specific individual as being Adam and, and a specific person to, to be Eve, then you have to explain what about <laughs> their parents yeah, who would yeah. have been extremely similar to them. Right, right. Um, where do they fit in with the whole story of salvation and image of God and, and mm-hmm. so on and so on? Um, I'm not saying there aren't some interesting ways to answer that question, um, but it, uh, it just seems like it is, it is slightly askew from the straightforward understanding I'd have of uh, uh, j- just opening scripture and trying to come to a a basic understanding of what I think it's saying, I wouldn't have expected Adam to have been made as uh, another creature, very much like many others who were around him at, at the time. Um, I, so I think that's probably my oh, yeah. major hesitation on seeing um, evolution as right. the thing that produced humanity. Right. Yeah, and I take that very seriously and I think that's a great point you make and it's funny it's just this guy I know stuff in Kinsella that some of your listeners he's a libertarian legal theorist he raised just that a similar point on that he was saying if you did believe in the standard evolutionary account what happens with souls and he was saying exactly you know what you were just saying too like did the the things that were right on the boundary line of homo sapiens like is it homo sapiens or is it the earlier thing did they have souls and it it, it was an interesting that I had never really thought through. So I have a feeling I had a back and forth with Kinsella once about um, intellectual property. <laughs> oh, he pro- did he bite your head off? Yeah. Well, he's, yeah. I, he's an irascible fellow. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I mean, I actually agree with a lot of his conclusions, weirdly, on that topic. But from, I have different um That doesn't guarantee reasoning. your safety. Yeah. No, <laughs> it didn't. <laughs> Anyway, uh, by the way, just to check in, we our cadence here <clears throat> is about twenty minutes per round, okay. and we've got six rounds. So I just I, I'd, I'd originally asked you for an hour. Are you okay to do two instead? I, if not, I we, can. We can I mean, speed we, up. How about we accelerate, but we don't need to catch up. up. We don't need to end at sixty. Like what? All right, let's aim for let's yeah. aim for ninety minutes. Yeah. How about that? <laughs> Approx. Um, and I'm going to give you I'm going to give you sixteen points for that round. All right, and. Just so you know, you're doing extremely well, so <laughs> you can relax. <laughs> a cinema or theater, world affairs, or epistemology? Let's try epistemology. Intuition is essential for knowledge. We can never know anything, or reality is subjective. Huh. Let's go with intuition is essential for knowledge. So I'll give the intuitive, haha. Mm-hmm. Are, I'm gonna, and so I'm going to say yes. I'm going to argue that this is true. The intuitive thing, and then I'll give a more formal one. So intuitively, I just there's just so many examples of when you can think you really understand something, and then somebody brings up some, or experience shows you, oh geez, I didn't even think of that complication, and it totally, you know, changes. And you're just, wow, now I'm wiser, and I mm-hmm. really understand it better now. There's been a few areas in my life like in personal, my personal life where I, I really thought things were a certain way. And mm. then I had this insight later, this, and I would call it an epiphany and realized, Oh wow. No, I had this fundamental misconception that colored my mm. perception of all these interactions in my personal life up till now. And Whoa. And it just, I've had that mm. happen. Um, and then even professionally, like, like certain things I, where I've been really committed to a view and I thought I had it nine different ways. And then I, it was just, there was some critical thing I was overlooking that unlocked. So I'm saying with all this stuff that if, if you didn't have intuition, you know, and just try to have things buttoned down that it just, that doesn't work. Cause you're, I think you're mm-hmm. always missing. It's like how you frame it could be wrong. So you might mm-hmm. quote, prove something, but the conclusions resting fundamentally on how you framed it. And so I think in intuition, even though intuition can be wrong, sometimes, mm-hmm. you know, you need that, nagging like no nah, this doesn't feel right and then more mm-hmm. formally people may know like with girdles and completeness theorem where you know where he demonstrated even for something as rigorous and as concrete as mathematics that any axiomatic system that you choose that there are true statements in the system that you can't prove within the system and mm-hmm. so to me like that kind of just shows the limits of formal axiomatic proof and 
So I would use that to sort of supplement this to say that's why, yeah, you're you're always going to be, no matter what other methods you use, you're always at some point going to be relying on like, nah, I just, I, I think it's, the answer is going to look like this. And if someone says why, and you're going to have to say, I just have a feeling. I can't prove it to you mm. right now. I just feel like the answer is going to be over here. Have you got an example of something which you had a, a strong intuitive feeling for and absolutely no rational um, driver for that feeling, but then later felt vindicated when you could then kind of back up your intuition with, with something more solid? Um, well, maybe this example. So just last night, my eldest son and I, um, we were on the phone for a while and we spent about 90 minutes. There was some logic puzzle that I saw on Twitter and the hmm. idea was just to say it real fast. There's a you're in prison and there's a chessboard and there's a coin on each of the 64 squares, either heads or tails. And the warden, you're, you're, you and your buddy, your cellmate can come up with a system. You agree upon it, but the warden can hear your you know monitor your conversation so he knows whatever you said. Your buddy mm -hmm. leaves the room. The warden shows you. I put the key to leave the cell under one of the squares. Like they they have little you know drawers you can put the thing in. And then uh -huh. you're allowed to flip one of the coins over. And the, and the warden can arrange the coins however he wants, knowing what your system wow. is. And then you can just flip one coin. Huh. And my son and I figured out on a two-by-two two version of that <laughs> how it works. And we went through. And, and if you and, can do it on two-by-two, two, that gives yeah. you a, like a, a foot yeah, in. And yeah. You can and so it. I'm saying in the process, it, it turns out like our method in principle would work for the full board, but it would take, <clears> you know, 60 billion years to write out all that. So... And people said, no, no, there's there's a quicker way. So I think what's going to end up happening is we're going to use our technique, but you only use a smaller portion of the board to communicate the information. The, the idea uh, is you come up with ways to, like, your buddy comes in yes. and sees the state of the board and you pre pre uh, beforehand agreed for these, you know, these possible states, that means it's in square one. For these possible states, that's my signal to you. It's in, and there's ways you can choose the arrangement of those into different buckets such yes. that no matter what the warden does by one move, <laughs> you can transform the board into a state that goes into the right bucket, given that you know where the key is. So that's how it works. But my point was when I was talking to my son about how that was going to unfold, before we had actually done it, I was just telling him, I said, no, the answer is going to look like this. So mm. let's, So I, it was more that my intuition was guiding our search through the possible strategies of how, how much can we, and I think it helps. So he, he was better... It like even goofy stuff. Like I was trying to write out the 16 possibility on the two by two board. I was trying uh -huh, to write out uh -huh. just the 16 permutations of what the, uh -huh. and I kept getting to like 13 and I couldn't figure out which ones I had skipped. <laughs> right. And he was, he was doing that, but I still feel like I was essential to us finding the answer. So it was like, I was like That's the strategy really and he yes. was the tactics, <laughs> mm -hmm. but me as the coach, I was, I was telling him like, just, you know, I think I have more experience solving problems like this. And I just told him, mm. No, you know, and I, I'm familiar with like encryption and hash functions and stuff. And I was just saying, no, no, the answer's got to look like this. And so I would say yeah, there, yeah. my intuition helped guide us. Although you know, the ultimate proof wasn't my intuition. It was like we had to, to show, yep, mm -hmm. we just proved it. We listed the 16 possible. This is what our rule is. Doesn't matter what the warden does. We can always blah, blah, blah. That's a that's a, such a good example of... Um, the distinction between the two. I, f I find this stuff at work quite a lot because um, I'm, I'm now old enough that graduates come into the company and seem s significantly junior to me. And mm -hmm. if, if we're working together, it's often the case that they, they a lot of people come into the company and are geniuses and they, they can work, they can write code much faster, much more accurately than, than I could. But I've got the experience, mm -hmm. um, and I'm, you know, in in your case, it would be, you know, even more extreme experience than what I'm. I'm just kind of getting the first kind of tastes of this. But where I can just sense that the progress is kind of veering off down down a, a dead mm -hmm. end, mm -hmm. and that's an intuition because I, I'm not in the weeds. You know, maybe it's something that they are working on day in and day out and i'm just kind of breezing by and, and hearing what's going on but um that's the in the intuition is somehow tapping into something that you um you can't express it's not a conscious 
set of steps, and so it's not a valid proof. Mm-hmm. Uh, but but there is something behind it, and right. Um, and I, I guess maybe um, wisdom is connected here. That uh, we right. I, I always enjoy the proverb that says the um, the beginning of wisdom is this: get wisdom. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> helpful, <laughs> but the um, the process over your your lifetime should be to train your intuition so that it guides you correctly. So it's it's not just that all intuition is truth finding, but actually that by carefully exposing yourself to the right things, you can build this powerful truth finding um, engine within you. Yeah. And and I really resonate with what you're saying about the work environment. The same thing with in my, the company I work with, Infinio, is a mm. similar process where we're building some stuff and yet like there's certain things and there's, yeah, certain people are very good at building, whatever, but a lot of times in the meetings, like my function is to just sit back a little bit and say, wait a minute, we're leaving this out. Or, well, what if some, you know, outside bed actor comes in and tries to do this? And they're like, oh, mm-hmm. yeah. They could, you know I mean? Like I, I, it literally happened yesterday where somebody, or two days ago, where, you know, some of like the programming guys were going through and trying to show how, no, that we don't have to worry about security on this application because there's nothing anybody could do. And they they had missed something, and I you know said no, this could happen, and they're like, oh hmm. yeah, <laughs> so yeah. But well, often the way I find it is, um, I guess the the thing that I've developed since I was a graduate myself is the ability to um, think about all of the people who are involved in the project, who, who to one degree or another, what are their actual interests and incentives the people who are making the decisions, what what are they actually trying to achieve? Because you've been given a task, you'll have been told mm-hmm. this is what you should try and do. But to take a step back and say, yes, but why are they asking for this thing? When you stumble across something as you're working, think about, oh, this might actually change their, the, the thing that they were, the, the, this person over here, maybe our, our client in some sense, mm-hmm. Actually, they probably want this is the this is the real thing they care about, and this thing that we've just discovered. Maybe they just want to completely pivot, and you know that it takes a certain um, step back and holistic perspective. Um, and I, I guess that's where the the more senior your role becomes, the more intuitive you have to be because the problems become fuzzier and based on more experience like that that's the thing that you have as you get right, older you, right. you don't have the sharp mathematical mind that you did when you were in your early 20s but you, but what you have got is a great amount more experience yep exactly yeah i it's funny i go and read stuff that i wrote when i was in grad school and i can kind of follow the argument but there's <laughs> no way i could produce it now like it would just be too much it'd be i wouldn't have the concentration to sit there and do it Uh, It, but yet i'm so much wiser now than you know there's a sense in which when i think of what how i thought the world worked when i was 27 it's it's laugh out loud funny how naive i was yes yes okay great let's uh let's call an end to that round i'm going to give you see my scoring system is very intuitive uh (laughs) i'm gonna give you 17 again okay by the way, I've had I've had a lot of complaints in the comments about the scoring system, and yet the format is extremely popular. So, <laughs> oh yeah, this for, this is great. Like I'm having fun, fun doing right? this. Uh, Good psychology, elite theory, or theology. I I'm intrigued by the elite theory. We got to go to that one. All right. Um, corporations have become the new aristocracy. Mainstream media is a tool in the hands of the elite. Or a global elite shapes world affairs. Let's go with C. Mm-hmm. And I will say yes. Okay, let's hear about okay, the so global he, elite. Sure. So here, um, I'll just very quickly recapitulate my own personal odyssey on this. So I was when I was younger, I I came to believe that the governments of the world had very bad policies in place in terms of things that, you know, would hamper human welfare. They would cause the business cycle, certainly 
if a major war breaks out, at least one party is doing something wrong, or maybe both. And so, mm. and I just mm. thought it was largely the result, certainly on economic issues, the result of ignorance. And mm. I just thought, oh, I just, we just need to, to teach people. And, and, a, and a, so one aha moment was I was an undergrad and one of my economics professors who was a real cool guy, like just, he was like, he advised the governor of Michigan and stuff. He was just this real cool cat. And, and I was talking to him about the minimum wage and I kind of matter of factly said that um, everybody in Congress who votes to raise the minimum wage thinks they're helping poor people. And he mm. like spit his drink out on me. He was like, what? And he goes, no, mm. they don't. And he goes, all right, maybe, <laughs> he goes, maybe one of them does. And I was looking at him and he goes, it's for the unions, man. You know, you know he was just looking uh, at me like, what are you talking about? And so, uh, you know, meaning union workers obviously benefit like because Poor, you know, unskilled yes. workers, the only way they can compete against union workers is if they undercut them. So by mm -hmm. raising the minimum wage, that makes it harder. And so that helps unions who are already getting paid well above the minimum wage. Yes. So and the, the unemployed poor don't give much money to politicians. So Exactly. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so you're filling in a thing like he just stopped it there just to show me no. And I believed him. But you're right. Then later to say, well, why is it that the unions have so much influence? That's why. And also to explain it's not just that union members have more money, but the unions collect dues. So all that money gets mm. to concentrate in the hands of a few decision makers. So then there's a guy who can write checks for 200 grand to one politician or the other. So that makes a lot more influence than, you know, even the, the, the middle-class workers who aren't unionized. Mm. Um, so mm -hmm. there's that. And then, you know, so over time, so I started with, Oh, okay. So there is more malevolence involved than I realized. Okay. There, and a lot more deception. And then, but I still, and I still had, you know, I heard these inklings and I thought there was these vague shadowy, like I'd heard, oh, maybe the people that own the banks or the oil companies really run the world. But I, I kind of thought, oh yeah, but if those people did exist, they would cover their tracks so you could never know who they were. And that's mm -hmm. kind of where I was for a while. Mm -hmm. And then my cousin sent me this YouTube, I guess documentary would be the word, called Wake Up Call. Mm. And this was the first one that really got me into the conspiracy genre. And mm -hmm. it was just, it was a compilation. Of, it was like largely drawn from other documentaries and stuff. And at the time, I didn't know who all these people were, but it was people like these, like Alex Jones and David Icke and things like that. And and I was just like, what? And I didn't, you know, I didn't believe it all at the time, but it it was, the point was, it, it a lot of those guys, like they were just making point and they, they were pointing to stuff that you could go independently check. That was the thing. Mm -hmm. like, some of the guys, some of the stuff they were saying was so over the top, I didn't believe it. But yeah, right. it, it was like you, they were making claims you could go just look them up and see. And it was like, oh, and so then I'm just saying over time, I was like, oh, there really is a Bilderberg group. There really is the CFO, mm -hmm. the Council of Foreign Related. There are these groups and you can go see. And maybe, you know, you don't believe every last little thing that Dick Cheney wasn't personally planning explosives on 9-11 or something. But it was, I'm saying like, yeah, there are these organizations, like the World Economic Forum exists and you can go and, Klaus Schwab in an interview openly said that I asked the graduates of our leadership, few, like young leaders program have penetrated the cabinets of this many government. That was the verb he used. He said, our graduates have penetrated the cabinets. So I'm going to say, yeah. you know, what, what, and a guy like literally looks and sounds like a James Bond villain, you know? Right. <laughs> so it's like, almost like <laughs> yeah. what more evidence do you need that? Yes, there are people. And so I think that the critical thing is maybe they think they're, doing it for the good of humanity. You know what I mean? Just like if like Americans often, we just had it every time, you know, the anniversary of dropping the atomic bombs on Japan happens. Americans have this soul searching. Was that the right thing to do? And the people who were for it was like, that saved lives. Da, da, da. So, you know, I could get inside a Hillary Clinton's head and think if the whole world was just run by me and my friends, there'd be mm. more, no more famine. There'd be no more war. Wouldn't that be good in the long run? So, so yeah, I, if we had to, do some certain things to get to that why not so anyway that's my i resonate enormously with that mm -hmm. um story of 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 your journey here i i think maybe it partly comes out of being sort of a nice and well-meaning and naive person you know <laughs> when mm -hmm. you're young you you can't you can't really imagine that anybody would be so genuinely malevolent and and power hungry mm -hmm. so it just doesn't factor into your your kind of model of humans and well and also let's not deny there is a lot of st 
ignorance and, and stupidity. Right. That's the other thing that makes the stupidity model kind of stand up is you think, well, yeah, most people just haven't thought about that if you raise minimum wage, you're effectively meaning that somebody who cannot produce sufficient value now is unemployable. Um, mm -hmm. as, as though you think, ah, oh, if, if only people understood this, then, you know, that's our path to utopia. Um, but uh, yes, I, I kind of, I've also, s s I think my view is that actually ideology matters much less than I used to think in either direction. I guess for a while I thought um, there was a, a sort of left-wing ideology that the people in power genuinely held. And I'm, I'm maybe much more cynical now. And I, mm -hmm. I think the, um, the, the ideologies are not really making much difference to policy so much as they are the explanation, the kind of post facto rationalization for, for some parts of right, right. the decision making, you know? Well, um, what's interesting to me, the, the, the way I can latch on to what you just said is in you, I just know about the U S more than others. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm coming from the right that, you know, like Republican conservative type, but then I became a libertarian and so on. But that's still my home base and those are the tribes in which I move. And no. so at any given time, typically the conservative slash libertarian tends to favor the Republican, but can't stand the guy because, oh, he's so bad. You know, he's such a sell. He's yeah. so wishy-washy, but he's always yeah. better than the Democrat, right? Hmm. In the, in the, but there was a tendency to think that, oh, yeah, the leftists, they love Biden and AOC and did it. Whereas, you know, now, especially with social media, it's easier for me to follow the accounts and, and talk to some of these people. And I'm realizing that, no, the average progressive hates Joe Biden's guts. Yes. And, you know what I mean? Yes. Like, so they, 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 but they hate Trump even more. And so it's the same. Mm -hmm. I'm realizing, like, oh, no, it really is the mirror image. And just like principled yeah. libertarians think, oh, you're going to associate us with Donald Trump? Are you kidding me? He doesn't even know free trade. Are you kidding? And likewise, you know, the yeah. average Gazan you know, progressive who supports Gaza saying, yeah, we can't stand Joe Biden's administration. So. Yeah, I, I guess, um, I've, yeah, I, I guess my view is now that there is no route through democracy to, um, to improve the way that leaders run things so i maybe maybe that's an interesting thing is that um democracy seems to have a certain effect i just to, to to a strange degree so i'd say that um whilst a lot of decisions are made completely independently of the democratic process um nonetheless the the leaders are to a degree constrained to do certain things because of the democratic system. Um, but the things that they choose to do because democracy is in operation, I think I've come to see as being almost entirely negative things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so like, if democracy had total power, which I don't think it does, and I don't think it possibly could, but if it did, it would not rule well. Um, it's, it's kind of the um, the the rule of the mob. I guess mm -hmm. you you see that if in in microcosm, um, in real life, you see a crowd get together and they'll do horrible, horrific things that none of the individuals right. would would do by themselves um that's the demos that you're <laughs> advocating for um so in a in a strange way um the the discovery of there being a powerful uh, elite of some sort who are not acting in your interests maybe the natural reaction is to go well we need to replace the elite with some kind of democratic system and i actually think that would be worse and the the real thing we should be hoping and praying for is is for godly leaders but we still want leaders we don't like the whole experiment as it were or the, the period of time of the judges was like 
well, this is every man does what he thinks is in his own eyes, and it's horrible. And then the kings come along, and most of the kings are terrible, and the people do horrible things mm. led by bad kings. But occasionally there's a good king, and that's the one thing that seems to actually work. Okay, yeah, let me respond quickly. So one th thing sure. more important even than your political commentary there is, I think you used the word whilst, and I just want to acknowledge that. <laughs> 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 I don't think I've ever had someone interview me and he said whilst. <laughs> so very good. Um, the as, as far as an example of how democracy, I, I give you a real silly example. In other words, that it's just the, the procedure itself often channels the worst things. So there was a, a deal in the U.S. I don't even remember how this happened, but like somebody had a, like a, a yacht or something that they mm -hmm. wanted to name. And instead of just them picking the name, they somehow like allowed the people, I don't know if it was Twitter or Facebook, they allowed for the public to, in a sense, choose it. And, you know, whichever one got the most votes. And I don't know, like, did they allow a nomination? So I, I, I wish I had more of the details, but yeah. the point is the winner and what they actually ended up writing on their yacht was Bodie McBoatface. <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> and so clearly you know, and you see why that won. Like, given what all the options were, you know, someone yes. might have said the you know, the USS Enterprise or da 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 da, and then but Bodie McBoat. So, but oh, that's funny. Let me vote for that. Yeah. And that won. Yeah. And so, you know, that's not a, a, a war crime or something. But I'm just saying, I think the only procedure that would have they generated that have outcome, taste. yes, was the you know the, the Democratic <laughs> one. And, and so there's that element. Um, a, a way I try to motivate this when I'm giving talks is say. Uh, would you want your babysitter to be decided by an election, you know, a, a election of the town's members, you know, like the, all your uh -huh. neighbors and various people get to campaign to babysit your kids for real. Right. Or, right. or, or the, the person who's going to change your brakes on your car. Would you yeah. want that individual to be to selected through the democratic pro? And, you know, usually if I talk to people like, or who you have to marry, you mm -hmm. know, is that person going to be selected by a vote of the community? And usually I'm seeing people be horrified yeah. It's thinking that, yeah. and I said, but yet that's how we decide, you know, who sets the rules about who ends up in cages for life possibly and who can start nuclear war. Isn't that kind of a weird <laughs> thing that you wouldn't trust them uh, with your babysitter, but you trust yeah. them to negotiate with Putin. That's kind of an odd system. So yeah. there, there's that element. Um, is, but then as far as the elites, oh, another thing too that I forgot to mention with this, the, you know, the Bible's pretty clear that the prince of this world is the devil. So I'm saying given my metaphysical views, it makes sense that, yeah, there is a sense in which the higher up you go in the hierarchy of earthly power, you start getting into some demonic stuff. And then, mm. you know, these are not nice people at the, at the top running the show. And so, you know, I, I, I do think that lines up biblically that, you know, the skepticism and to think that, oh, no, there's some shadowy forces at work behind the scenes and they have to cover their tracks and hide in the darkness. So mm. you're right. To me, the solution to this is not to just have more political democracy because I think the global elite are experts at hijacking that. You know what I mean? Mm. Like they, they like, they can work with that system. They can, they've got it. I used in a, a joke of last year when I had to dress my toddler and I went in, you know, he, he didn't, there was a period he didn't like putting clothes on. And so <laughs> I wanted to put a shirt on him and he wouldn't, you know, he wouldn't let me do it. And so I held up two shirts and I said, okay, uh, do you want this shirt or do you want this shirt? And that was the way to get him. And that know, worked. And then I said, and remember, everyone, voting day is, you know, next Tuesday, so we'll go vote. You know, and some people got the joke that I was making. <laughs> uh, so um, so anyway, yes. I'm just saying that, yeah, yes. that it's but, not that that thwarts right. it. It's like they can easily use that system. That's such, a, that's such a good analogy. It's like, I don't want to be ruled. I don't want to mm -hmm. be ruled. Okay, I'll be ruled by that one. <laughs> right, right. No, we're going to give you a choice. Oh, if you let me choose, okay. So, yeah. <laughs> and there's such a chasm between these two. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, right. Yeah, they've both got two arms. They both. <laughs> um, I, I, the, the, as a last thing on this round, I think it's always, it's always comforting to me um, to hear the opening of Psalm two. Uh, Why do the nations conspire and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against His anointed, saying, "Let us break their chains and throw off their shackles." The one enthroned in heaven laughs. Yep, and that's that's such an amazing response. It's not even it's not even a concern to to God. The 
the nation's rising yeah, up against him. Exactly. And I don't know, Luke, your view, like your background, but for me, I was raised Catholic and then I spent a period of atheism. I think actually the last time you had me on, I gave the story real fast. And then mm-hmm. I, I became a Protestant and so on. So I, when I read um, G.K. Chesterton's The Man Who Was Thursday, are you familiar with that? Mm-hmm. So there. Uh, no. Oh, no. okay. Well, I, I don't want to spoil. All right. I won't talk uh, about that. Also, it, my audience, you know, they yeah. might not have read it. Okay. Yeah. So a anyway. To my audience. Go and, I, there's I a, will also go. Yeah. There's a sense, uh, something in there that I, I'll be vague about. Okay. The idea that it's not the, the, the battle of good versus evil and it's God versus the devil and they're battling and, oh, it's a nail biter. And we're not sure who's going to come out on top. I hope the forces of good are, in other words, it's not that God is Luke Skywalker and right. the devil is Darth yeah, Vader. It's no, that, God is George Lucas. Right. And he's telling yeah. a story. Of, yeah. You know what I mean? Like that's. I always find it so funny. I mean, it's probably not so true anymore, but there was a period where the rebellious anti-Christian kind of devil worshiping crew were all listening to heavy metal and, and kind of, it was all very muscular, rah, rah, pagan kind of celebration of, mm-hmm. um, you know, how how macho they were in comparison to the w- weak and wimpy yeah. Christians who were yeah. all following this kind of... Oh, turn the other cheek. Um, yeah. Meek and mild. Mm-hmm. And you're like, how, how on earth can you paint yourselves as this these powerful victor warriors in the face of your ultimate certain defeat, total and utter capitulation and knee bowing that will one day be your position yeah yeah i guess it's i guess it's just just uh anyway let's do two super speed super speed rounds to finish okay sure um i oh i need to give you a score don't i uh yeah no 16 will do um round five technology natural sciences or christology uh technology technology is a force for good Virtual reality will pacify the oppressed masses, or AI poses a greater threat than nuclear weapons. Uh, maybe let's do the middle one, just because I've been talking a lot about AI and other podcasts. I'm kind of sick of it. So, okay, yeah, fair. I will say yes. That that certainly that that will be the attempt, and I think it will help. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. Um, you know, one historical precedent is I think. I don't know if you know, but alcohol was illegal in the United States in the 1920s. Like that's where Al Capone flourished and what, and then Roosevelt comes in in the midst of the great depression. And one of the things they did was they got rid of that amendment. I forget which one it was and legalized alcohol again. Mm, And so I think that was partly how, you know, whether he believed in that, I don't know, but I'm just saying, I think that's partly what explained because there was some very heavy handed things that happened during the, you know, the, the Roosevelt administration. And I think that was one way they kind of got everyone to not revolt. And to, <laughs> to mm-hmm. some people, mm-hmm. yeah. so likewise, um, yeah, I do think, and, and it, it kind of ties into our UBI discussion. I think they are realizing as we can start tightening the, the, the vice, and the, the top-down control and all the monitoring and I, you know, there's drones and so, and I have no doubt that in my lifetime, it's going to be the case that if you step out of line, that a drone takes care of you, mm. and, you know, and how do you define mm. step out of line? You know, okay, we could, but I'm saying, I think that's going to end up being the case. And so well, um, apparently reading the New Testament is the, the latest way to. Yeah. Oh, yeah, right. Exactly. So <laughs> I'm saying, you know, how do you I think the partly the way to keep everybody and, you know, all this just you know, I'm, not, I'm not saying anything novel here, like all the pornographers online. I think that, yes, this is going to be the way that everyone's going to get plugged in and they're going to be living in these very, you know, small and it's going to be sold as, oh, this is very uh, climate respectful and blah, blah, blah. You know, you're going to have a very low carbon footprint. You're just living in this little cubicle. Your basic needs are going to be met. You don't even have to work really because UBI Mm. is going to take care of it. The robots are going to make everything. And so most people are just going to be passively, you know, living in this alternate reality. And so notice it's turning into the world of the matrix. Mm. Mm. And so... You know, the difference being in the world of the Matrix, they need the people as batteries, which I always thought was dumb. Like, no, there's a lot mm. telling you all that technology and they need human bodies to generate electricity. That seems kind of stupid. <laughs> yeah, it's a little weak. But, yeah. So, but I'm saying here, the, the point being to, to the extent that maybe they, this is the last thing I'll say, and I'm curious your reaction. I know we got to be fast here. 
Sure. One might wonder, well, what what point does that serve? Like you, you're admitting they don't generate electricity. Like the like the the people running the show, their machines can work without. I think it's partly because what's the point of taking over the world if you're not in charge of people, right? Mm -hmm. Like I think that, mm -hmm. no, if I'm going to take over the world, I don't want to wipe everybody out, you know, like maybe you got to take care of, you know, I know there's all these plans, the, the agenda of the UN and da, da, da. So yeah. sure. But still you want enough people that you can rule over. Otherwise, what's the point? <laughs> mm -hmm. if, if your goal is raw power is that's what I'm saying. So I, I think that, yes, that moving towards that realm where there are a few people in charge and yes, using virtual reality that they can steer at least the broad contours of, and they're mm -hmm. already laying the framework for how would we do that to be able to regulate it and control it and whatnot, having back yeah. doors for the administrators. I think yeah. that's certainly going to be part of the story so that when we looked ahead and say, why is everyone so content with this? Like to us, it's going to be, you're all living in a prison and they mm -hmm. say, yeah, but look at how entertaining it is. I can go explore the Andromeda galaxy and da 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 by just putting mm -hmm. on this headset. And whereas mm -hmm. the the real world is very drab. Yes, yes. I think you're totally right to broaden virtual reality to include all these kind of distractions. Like you could limit it to just the headset that you put on and the, mm -hmm. the total immersion. But <clears throat> what is a video game or a movie or scrolling through Instagram except ways that you can live a a virtual life that kind of pacifies you from, from the, the troubles mm -hmm. you have in, in your real life. Um, and I, I'd say that the lockdowns would not have been possible without uh, the entertainment technology that we, we have right. now. Right. Um, I, I have to say, looking back on, there was a period in 2020 and probably through to quite long after actually the lockdowns had lifted where I was fairly convinced that even if they lifted it would only be temporary um, and that at least over over the winter months we would be kind of subjected to lockdowns for the rest of our lives so I'm kind of strangely sort of pleasantly surprised that that has I mean, I'm still not ruling it out that it, it yeah. won't come back in a vengeance in, in some sense but um, it's, it's an interesting question of what's the actual incentives we were talking in the last round about the the elites what you know they, they have both abilities and then also kind of interests or objectives mm -hmm. and those objectives come from somewhere there, there has to be some starting point of what they want to achieve and um i guess if power is what motivates them th then maybe part of it is the uh, the delta of their life versus the life of the, of the masses how much they've elevated themselves and so having everybody living very small poor limited lives when they have complete freedom i could imagine being some kind of thrill um but in, in another sense um the i i kind of think there's an there's an interesting reaction to this possibility the, to go down a more soldier nitson route of saying mm. actually regardless of what happens you can ha you can always find freedom um even if you know just to a degree there's always the oppressed and the oppressor. That's a very Marxist way of looking at the world. Um, and there's, you know, there's there's truth to that. Uh, but I think it kind of buys into a very materialistic, one-dimensional assessment of, uh, of the world. I, I think both the left and the right, and to a degree, you know, libertarians and um, and every other political party tend to fall into this tra and 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 I fall into it a lot often as well but like the world is not oh well maybe, maybe the Jesus maybe Jesus quote is the best way to approach this is um does your life not consist of more than your possessions you know if you mm -hmm. um if you have the promise of eternal life and the ability to pray and, um, you know, commune with your loving Heavenly Father. Um, th there actually is no 
prison that they could throw you in that's worse than the the one that they're going to themselves, you know? Um, so I guess that's to say that the virtual reality is something that you cannot be forced into. So yes, most people will go into the virtual reality, but that's actually something that they are only doing voluntarily. No matter how much they take you to the water, you don't have to drink from it. Um, so yes, if, if I guess what I'm saying is the fact that the masses are so quick to take up the virtual reality that they offered is also symptomatic of their spiritual poverty and not just of their material conditions. And that's something that could be uh, changed through miraculous means um, entirely outside of the control of the elites aforementioned. Yes, definitely. I agree. I wholeheartedly agree with everything you just said there. And yeah, I've, I think I've seen a, two related trends where it seems to me that there are more explicit attacks on Christianity in the United States for sure than I've ever seen in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. Including like you say, like using now this recent, you know, the October 7th stuff and the anti-Semitism to then mm. circle back and say, oh, so now you can't quote certain passages from the New Testament. And then that makes a bunch of mm. Christians sit mm. up who normally, you know, we're kind of on the mm -hmm. sidelines on all this stuff. And then to get, you know, so right now, like it's, I have never seen anything in the same zip code is right now huh. the open hostility between Christians and Jews in the United States. And, uh -huh. you know, and it, it just came, yeah. it seemed like it came out of nowhere. Like, wow. Right. Um, so yeah. there's that element. And then, uh. and I think, Partly that is because, you know, if, if we're, if I'm right, and I, I don't want to include that with this march of what the elites are trying to do, they're mm -hmm. realizing, yes, the last bastion, at least in terms of the United States, is going to be, you know, gun-toting Christians who, I don't believe you're pointy-headed, <laughs> you know, that kind of mentality. And so they, that needs to be neutralized. So even though uh, while there's this open frontal assault on Christianity, like the likes of never which we've seen, with everything going on, like all the new age, and what, like it's... Somebody can now go on Joe Rogan and talk about his faith in Jesus and how he thinks he came back from the dead. And Rogan was like, oh, mm -hmm, okay, yeah. Mm. You see what I mean? Whereas mm. I think mm. a somewhat liberal guy would have not wanted to be associated with, the, you know what I mean? Whereas now, like, everything yeah. is so, everything's spiritual. And I'm at one with the universe that, like, that now you're allowed to talk about standard Christian stuff and it's not. Mm. So it's, it's an interesting combination of trends. Yeah, I saw um, Russell Brand got baptized recently, apparently. He was always very into the woo, new age, general spiritual stuff. Um, and now he seems to be more more so pinning his mask to Christianity specifically. I never I never know I never want to celebrate celebrities conversions too heavily. Are you talking about Russell but, Brand? Is that his name? Yeah, the yeah, I the you comedian. Said Brown. Okay. No, Brand. I remember um Kanye West was went through what briefly seemed like a fairly yeah, that guy, thing and is now doing Did he recently do some so. pornographic thing? Yeah, yeah, it's too bad with him. I was hoping, because whenever seemed, that happens, like there's a lot of American Christians that are very like, you know, stick in the mud. They know this yeah. is just fake. This is, And I like to give people the benefit of the doubt and, and say, uh, well, no, uh, I mean, you know, it, but yeah, with him, it, it doesn't, it doesn't look good. No, but then you can never... You can never know what's in somebody's heart. Yeah, right, really. yeah. It's not my he job. Could, and he could be a sort of uh, Samson figure. <laughs> yeah. I, so I hope, anyway, I hope he does. I hope it was genuine. And, I mean, it's, in a way, it's yeah. nice that he's no longer, because there was a brief period where he was both, um, you know, the big Christian celebrity and also the rabid anti-Semitic yeah. uh, neo-Nazi. <laughs> so th that was a that was an awkward optical. Yes. Event. Yes. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, oh, did I show you a score for last one? I was going to go sixteen again. Uh, that brings okay. us to our last round: right, literature, so software, right and mathematics, yeah. eschatology. Oh, I guess let's do eschatology. Yeah, you, yes. you don't sound sure. Well, I just because this is my, I'm not very well versed in this stuff. Like, I wish I knew more, but yeah. let's go ahead and, and this will, if I, if I fumble the ball, that will just inspire me to study more. Good, good, yeah, for, for next year's uh, gauntlet, the new creation will be an entirely different realm. Contemporary events are signs of the end times. 
or modern Israel is relevant to end time prophecy. If you want to get really, I think when I wrote these questions, yeah. that wasn't quite such a hot button. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> All right. Let given that I picked the dangerous title, let me go with this. To me, the safest one here, the the middle one. Okay. Um, and I, so I'm gonna be a bit uh, wishy washy on this. That on the one hand, I mean, it, it says. You know, you're not going to know that the. I mean, Jesus does even makes it sound like he doesn't know when the end of the world is going to be. At least when he was here as a man talking to people. Um, I think it's saying, explicitly said, isn't it? Yeah, that, yeah. Only the that? Father knows, right? So, um, and he's going to come as a thief in the night, that sort of thing. So, mm. I I think you could argue in a sense, like if there's a Christian saying, "No, I'm reading the Book of Revelation," and you know what, I am absolutely certain it, this is happening next Thursday. I want to say, well, that can't be. Like Jesus told you, you can't know. You know, you know so I, w I would say that. Mm -hmm. um, and I know historically, lots of particular like cults and whatever they get locked in, and they have a particular prophecy, and they think, oh no, it's this date, and we know. It. And so certainly, you want to avoid that stuff. Having said all that, like to me, it's clear like this world system that we t earlier alluded to with the elites and whatever that they are. Um, you know, like, is it going to be like a global, a one world government with a CBDC? And so if you get out of line, they just turn it off. And that's the sense in which if you don't have the mark of the beast, you can't engage mm -hmm. in, in commerce. I, th I, I think that's what it means to give an example. So now are they going to have that system up and running by next Thursday? Thankfully, no. So when we say contemporary events, a sign of the end times, you know, that, that that's, I'm not saying, right, this is it get ready, the four horsemen are coming, you know, by fourth quarter. That's not what I'm saying, but I do think some of the things we are seeing being developed right now, I think is what the book of Revelation means in terms of like what it means, like the beast system, for example. Mm -hmm. And incidentally, so that's partly, I do have signs of hope besides just the ultimate assurance that, you know, Jesus is coming back and it's going to fix everything. Um, that, People, it's people are going to be able, like the remnant's going to be able to secede from this system that's being built to corral most people into it. You know what I mean? Like, in other words, everyone doesn't have to go along and put on the VR headsets and live in the two by two or the eight by eight cubicle. Um, and so, and that's, you know, even in my day job, that's kind of we're building financial tools and whatever I think to give people more independence so that they have opt out ability, just like in the actual movie, The Matrix. You know, some people, Morpheus's people got free and they were doing their stuff. So, I mean, it's, there's that element of, is, is how I see things unfolding. But yeah, I do think when I read the book of Revelation now, there's several things that I think like, oh yeah, that's, I mean, and obviously world events keep, the Middle East seems like it's got a lot going on all the time <laughs> in terms of mm -hmm. you know, global conflict. So I, I don't think that's a coincidence. I think that the Bible is the inspired word of God and that the book of revelation showing this is where stuff's going to come to a head. And it, you know, it quite clearly says that there's going to be a period where the prince of this world's kind of running the show. And I think that's, to me, that's these efforts towards, you know, one world government and such. I, I'm enjoying that you've mentioned the matrix twice. Cause um, <laughs> I've got, I've got another creative project on at the moment that I'm making a, a kind of a radio play um, with a script that was inspired by The Matrix. It goes in a slightly different direction, but uh, I'll make sure that there's a link in the description for people who, who want to go and check that out. Um, I always think that the, um, <clears throat> the sense in which nobody knows the end times in the Bible, uh, in the New Testament, it's very clear that, as you say, nobody will know, nobody will see it coming, nobody will be, you know... Um, able to call it exactly but it's always in the sense of so be prepared and kind of act as if it was about to happen right, right you know prepare yourself prepare your soul you know be be minded of the end times rather than the opposite which i i think is very sensible to say um you know to to say we're not going to have a specific day and date with a lot of prep time so that that's something you should probably ignore um but also if people are saying it's gonna be years or decades away for sure 
and that I'd say that's probably even more dangerous actually that um, yeah, yeah that's a good point you're making and yeah I agree certainly that's the the point of Jesus saying that is so be ready because you don't know you know th- yeah don't think oh yeah I, I'm gonna have my fun and then but at some point I'll get serious and buckle down and get yeah. right with God like yeah don't that's a, not a good attitude to have here's a couple of verses so two Peter three uh, above all you must understand that in the last days scoffers will come scoffing and following their own evil desires they will say where is this coming he promised ever since our ancestors died everything goes on just as it has since the beginning of creation um and then you will hear wars and rumors of wars nation will rise against nation kingdom against kingdom um people will be lovers of themselves lovers of money boastful proud uh, having a form of godliness but denying its power have nothing to do with these people um uh, yes very, very very interesting there's there's lots of stuff i'd encourage people to go and kind of do do a do a study of uh predictors of the end times um but yes i i am not entirely convinced but kind of keep abreast of the people who make very specific claims you know the type of thing like or if you read this verse in ezekiel it's talking about russia Mm -hmm, Um, mm -hmm. and you're like "Ah, not entirely sure that's correct but also i i feel like it's probably wise to at least put a bit of effort into trying to interpret these things i think like um jesus reprimanded the religious leaders of his day for not picking up on the signs of his coming like right, they should right. have figured out mm-hmm. the prophecies were pointing to him but at the same time it would be very easy for people to be over reading those signs before jesus showed up and by finding um you know oh this is this person must be the messiah because they check this box and this box mm-hmm. and what about that box well just ignore that it doesn't quite fit the pattern you know Good. Yeah, all right. Yeah, well, so my, yeah, my, just to echo what you're saying, sure. right? I, if somebody does have an interpretation, I will, I will give it a hearing. Like, it's not that I say, "Oh, geez, the very idea of you thinking you can read the Bible and that's going to give you some guidance and according to what." No, I'm. It's <laughs> it's supposed to guide you in your personal life. I wouldn't help you navigate global political intrigue. Um, but, but right. I also like we were saying with you know, I've seen enough examples where it blew up in their faces to know you got to be real careful when you get into that stuff. There's this parable, isn't there, with the um virgins, some of whom have enough oil for the lamp and some of whom don't, and they're both they're, like the whole group are waiting for the arrival of the groom, and that so they want to be ready for his arrival, they want to stay awake for it. All of them fall asleep. Um but only some of them had enough oil ready. Um, and I always think that's interesting that actually they all fall asleep. So it's mm-hmm. kind of, um, yeah. n- nobody's going to kind of get to the end of their lives on and get into the kingdom of God on merit. But but some people are at least, um, you know, on, uh, you know, they're at least making a kind of, um, an attempt for it, and that's that's what kind of ends up mattering. I feel like I've really bungled that. <laughs> I, I, hopefully, if you've watched enough of my channel, I've given you a, a like a much better explanation of um, soteriology. <laughs> but, uh, um, given time is getting away from us, we might have to leave it there. Um, <clears throat> now, I don't know quite how to score you here because I feel like a wishy-washy answer should not get a high score. Mm-hmm. But also, I think your wishy-washy answer was correct, and I shouldn't <laughs> just give you more points for saying something that's more exciting but not true. So <laughs> uh, I'm going to give you 16. I reckon. Why not? I and that low brings standard us to deviation. The, well, yes, that's you're probably the most consistent scorer. And I suspect perhaps our highest scorer, but let's find out. So I need to refresh the high score table to find out where you've landed. There you are. All right. 98 miles. About, look at all these other people who you've crushed in the dust before you. Um, look, this, this, these are all your um, fellow competitors. Now, and, I'm and curious. It would be interesting if you cross-referenced that with the date of appearance, because I wonder if there's great <laughs> inflation. 
You know what I mean? Like maybe nothing, the beginning when this nothing gets this, past you. <laughs> yeah, this approach was new. Maybe you're grading harder than over time. Like, oh, and everyone starts to scorn more. Yeah, that's an interesting theory. I, 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 I wonder. I wonder if you're onto something there. Um, maybe after the completion of the series, I think I'll, I'm only going to have another couple of guests after you, and then I will. I was. I, I thought it might be. Uh, anyway, yes, I, I will. Uh, <laughs> I will do said investigation, and perhaps you, you know, you'll see how far you are above the line of best fit. Okay. So, thank I, you so much for joining me. Yeah, thanks. This was great. And uh, like yeah, I said, a, a very interesting uh, approach to the interview. And yeah, this was fun. I, I knew it would be. Amazing. All right. Bye. You've just experienced another episode of The Bob Murphy Show, the podcast promoting free markets, free minds, and grateful souls. For more information and to subscribe to this podcast, visit bobmurphyshow.com. <laughs>